Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Manzawadi. I'm an assistant professor at the Faculty of Medicine uh, in the uh, Department of Human Genetics at McGill University. And I'm also an associate member of uh, the Biomedical Ethics Unit, as well as the Division of Experimental Medicine in the same university. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to talk to you a little bit about justice, digital health, and the distances uh, that have been um, you know, appearing over the past uh, little while. So to answer the first question around um, the distances that we see in justice and digital health, and, you know, how are new distances appearing? Well, you know, digital health is, is having a significant impact on the practice of medicine, uh, but it's largely unregulated. So consumer digital technologies, including smartphone applications, uh, are playing an important role in making healthcare more effective, efficient, and accessible. But the problem we have is that the absence of regulation in Canada and elsewhere threatens to diminish this promise. Uh, the primary distance uh, that I can say that has appeared in this space is that between digital health's potential and the availability of regulation and guidance, the structures it's used and ensures its safety in the Canadian context. Now in 2019, uh, Health Canada released its first guidance document on what it calls a software as medical device. Uh, this guidance came into effect in December, 2019 and provides a number of different stakeholders, actually clinicians, researchers and technology developers with some guidance on Health Canada's administrative approach to digital health. Um, and that includes smartphone applications uh, for health. The document itself helps to close some of the distance uh, between digital health potential and the absence of regulation uh, that characterizes its present uh, operational condition. At the same time, however, uh, many of the digital tools that are currently increasing in popularity among the general public, including what we consider or call symptom checker applications, are not included in clear uh, terms, at least, in Health Canada's new regulatory regime. And this may leave open pressing questions about the ethical management of these tools. Um, now, we are in a pandemic, and that has been ongoing now for many months. With the emergence of COVID-19 uh, pandemic across the world, and especially uh, in, in you know, the different jurisdictions, the landscape uh, that surrounds digital health has shifted dramatically. An abundance of uh, new applications, I mean, really great wealth of applications and systems uh, have been developed in recent months to assist public health agencies in their efforts to control COVID-19. These apps and systems have a wide range of functions, some of which raise, you know, uh, very important questions about privacy and surveillance. In some jurisdictions, smartphone apps are being used to monitor individual movements, uh, to ensure compliance uh, with public health rules or to deny access to public spaces to people determined uh, to be at higher risk of infection. Now, of course, this is not in all jurisdictions, um, you know, but, uh, but you know, even there, there are some highly invasive measures that are put in place. And these really underscore the importance of a regulatory framework that is capable of earning and maintaining uh, the public's confidence and trust. Particularly, you know, when you think about mobile health, you know, they, it's used uh, to advance health objectives and their efficacy is highly determined uh, by the degree to which the public trusts these systems. And public trust in turn, you know, requires that these systems operate in a, uh, you know, it, operate in according uh, to fundamental legal and ethical principles. COVID-19 has exaggerated uh, the distances created by mobile health generally. And, and you know, it's a disease um, that is not equitably distributed as well across the population. People who are less wealthy, who are older, uh, and who have achieved less uh, inter, you know, educational attainment are the most at risk of contracting this disease and of experiences its most serious effects. These are the same groups who are most likely to face barriers in accessing mobile health and who are most likely to distrust digital health uh, interventions from government agencies or health officials. Uh, COVID-19 makes really the distances here in mobile health more pronounced. Um, COVID-19 has also made uh, the absence of robust regulation more challenging. Given the 
you know, urgency of the pandemic, applications and systems are proliferating at an incredible rate, uh, but they are not necessarily reliable. Uh, in the absence of regulation and guidance, uh, these may cause, uh, unfortunately, increased levels of unmitigated harm. Now, if we think about the potential consequences from a social legal uh, perspective and, and, and those that would come to the fore, well, there, there's a few of them. Um, I would say the first one um, is increased inequality. So there is a risk that unregulated digital health companies and, and technologies may perpetuate existing inequalities in healthcare by providing care only to the most technologically literate or to those who can afford the devices on which these digital systems are run. Another uh, consequence is the ineffective or dangerous uh, level of care. So in a largely unregulated landscape, it is possible that ineffective or dangerous digital health solutions will proliferate. Recent scholarship on, on the accuracy of mobile health applications are found, you know, have found that popular symptom checker applications pose significant accuracy challenges uh, with the correct diagnosis not appearing on lists of possible conditions more than 40% of the time. And let's not forget, these symptom checker applications are not supposed to be providing any diagnosis. Uh, but even though they say they are not, uh, most of the times they are in practice. There are also uh, concerns uh, you know, related to privacy violations. So the absence of regulation, digital health systems are likely to have highly variable privacy and consent practices. You know, some of them actually don't even have privacy policies. And this may have serious consequences for the users of these systems, uh, potentially subjecting them to privacy harm and discrimination on the basis of sensitive health information. And finally, shifts in uh, healthcare professions and our relationship to them is one of the consequences of these uh, of these new distances uh, you know if, if you look at mobile health you know technologies more specifically uh, you know potentially they will make access to healthcare far more accessible but they also disrupt the normal course, course of the uh, physician patient relationship now um, what are the consequences on the stakeholders or the actors uh, implicated um, or the institutions implicated? Uh, well, there's a few of that as well. You know, healthcare systems and clinicians might become increasingly burdened by individuals and clinicians who are unsure of the relationship to digital health. Individuals will be unsure whether digital health technologies are reliable and accurate, which may reduce their willingness to use them. Uh, digital health firms and developers will operate in an uncertain regulatory environment. And then regulators here may face a particularly difficult situation if digital health develops for an especially long period of time in the absence of oversight. And governments and public health agencies may face an erosion of public confidence, leading the public to ignore public health measures and advice. Is there a way, so another question here in the, the how, is there a way to counter these changes? And if so, how, or if not, how do we adapt ourselves? Uh, well, the, the distances generated by digital health can be addressed by clear, holistic you know, regulation, but a multilateral one. Uh, that involves, of course, Health Canada, and they've worked on that, but that's, you know, one part of the equation. Um, you know, so, so you, you need ad additional bioethics work on the pressing questions surrounding mobile health. And this will help to inform regulators and clinicians. You can think of consumer protection, for example, and having a, a you know a role to play in all of that. But you have to also think about professional societies uh, that self-regulate the health professions, and they will likely have an important role to play in informing their members of the legal and ethical considerations to which they should be attentive when engaging with mobile health technologies. And finally, this is sometimes an area that we tend to forget public information campaigns may help inform the public of the best way to engage with mobile health in a manner that works to assure safety and encourage public trust. And finally, if there are references um, that could be um, looked at or reviewed with regard to this question, of course, you know, they, they, they come in manuscripts, they come in articles, they come in policies. I mean, one policy that I would strongly suggest uh, the viewers to, to take a look at is, of course, the Health Canada Software as Medical Devices uh, guidance document from 2019. I think it will provide a very interesting approach. If you're interested in the questions about digital health, but also artificial intelligence more generally and how this affects 
patients and that how this affects uh, physicians down the road. I would recommend uh, some books uh, written by Eric Topol. Um, he wrote a book called The Patient Will See You Now. Of course, you know, uh, talking about empowerment, but also deep medicine, uh, how artificial intelligence can make healthcare uh, human again. Um, and this is a very interesting book because, you know, one of the really interesting premises of, or the argumentation, I would say, uh, of this book is, you know, when we think of artificial intelligence in medicine, we always tend to think that it's going to replace the physician. But he, he argues the fact that, you know, what it's going to do, it's going to make the patient physician relationship human again, where the physician was going to be, you know, focused on consultation on aspects that they wouldn't generally uh, have enough time to do because of all the administrative and work that they, that now they can delegate to or have an artificial intelligence tool or application uh, do. And finally, uh, you know, for those who are interested, our center at the Center of Genomics and Policy uh, has worked on a number of different articles uh, looking at mobile health apps um, in Quebec and in Ontario, mobile health apps regulation more generally, and mobile health app from an international perspective and how they uh, would work, um, especially when they're integrated in the research setting. Thank you very much for your time.